I just got back from a weekend in London. When I first moved abroad, I used to feel really guilty and sort of track the amount of time I spent back in the place that I had left. And honestly, I've got some weird internet messages, comments from people asking why I go home, I guess, quote unquote, so much. But um, honestly, I've come to make peace with it and just realise that um, if going home fairly often um, on the Eurostar to visit the people that I love means that I can continue to live a fulfilling life abroad then it doesn't really matter it's um especially because we travel by Eurostar we try and reduce our footprint of visiting home and it's okay to have two homes I guess so I went back to London this weekend to celebrate one of my best friend Siska's birthdays and we had a really lovely time we were both quite unwell at different points of the weekend which is always a struggle with having a sick friendship that you sometimes can't find yourself in alignment but we made the most of it and yeah it was really lovely and then on Sunday one of my like childhood teenage best friends I've had for a really long time Ellie <laughs> picked me up we went for a nice mooch around Crystal Palace to the bookshops and the antiques I didn't buy anything because I was trying to be good with my uh my spending and also I know I wouldn't be able to carry it on my own as this was a solo trip and then we went back to hers had a lovely gorgeous nap and then woke up and had sort of like an indoor barbecue because it was raining which of course it was because it's London and we um yeah caught up with another one of our best friends and it was honestly like three hour long therapy the most beautiful soulful intimate Sunday evening that I could have asked for so well worth it just for that um, and now I'm back in Amsterdam. I have had to go to the hospital again this week, so it's been a medically, medically heavy week, but I am glad to be home here and in the sun, despite the circumstances. Hey everyone, welcome back to another vlog. I hope you enjoyed the new kind of voiceover situation because I filmed a lot of clips while I was away but I thought it would be nice to explain them and yeah show you what I got up to while I was back in the UK. Reading wise I read actually a couple of books while I was there or oh, I finished one. Started one, finished one, started another and didn't finish it. So I read Berlin by B. Seton. My friend in Amsterdam lent me this as they are a friend of B's so um that was really cool it was published by double day i do remember seeing it around a bit when it came out i want to say last year and this is a suspense literary uh messy person in their 20s kind of book um which i haven't read a lot of those recently and for good reason because i think you can get sick of that trope quite quickly and they can be quite samey but i actually found this one really funny um way way more funny than i was expecting so we follow our narrator Daphne as she moves to Berlin, abandoning a life in London because of some various mistakes and misdemeanors she got up to. She starts a life in Berlin under like a false pretense of being a PhD student, even though she didn't get into any of the PhD programs she wanted to be a part of. She takes up various sublets and falls in with different people in her German classes and then goes about a Berlin-ish kind of life, although V. Seton's definitely also mocking the uh, the stereotypes of Berlin, which I really enjoyed. So um, I loved this book probably until the final 20 pages. The payoff wasn't really there for me, but that's I hesitate to sort of dismiss a book based on the ending. I find that um, unfair, I guess, on the author's experience because I don't dismiss a meal based only on dessert. So I did really enjoy the reading experience of this. I thought, like I said, it was funny and witty. The author, the... Um, character was really self-aware and there was a lot of commonality just between like moving from the UK to a big metropolitan European city and those experiences and like how embarrassing it is sometimes to be uh, a ex-Londoner in a new place and sort of yeah I just thought the characterization was really fleshed out I could really see this mismatched ragtag group of people that Daphne falls in with and the like I say various tropes and stereotypes of Berliners that and expats that um 
Seton was engaging with. So yeah, I really did enjoy this one and easy read, short chapters, like there is that, that level of suspense, like I say, that's sort of bringing you through most of the book and uh, makes it, yeah, a compelling read. Then I listened to all of, basically, like on my travels and then finished it while I was uh, unwell this week, sort of in multiple hour stints, because it's quite a long audio book, it's like 15 hours, and that was The Shadow Cabinet by Juno Dawson, which is the second book in her Majesty's Royal Coven series, which is a witchy fantasy series I spoke about in my radar video, and um, have been following sort of since the first book came out. The audio books are my favourite, they're narr narrated by Nicola Coughlin, um, and the second one was really good. It did take, I was chatting to my family about it, so it like, took me a really long time to sort of grasp all the strings that we had left from the previous book. I kind of wish I did a re-listen um, because I think it would have improved my reading experience for that first like 20% of the book, I would say. But all the characters are still there and the the way that Juno Dawson really envelops current feminist issues into her fantasy world so seamlessly. I find so enjoyable. I would not label this issue fiction if you watched my previous video about how I have such a problem with this. This is such a masterclass in how to talk about things without actually having, without actually sort of forcing them onto the reader in any way. And this is, book is also full of morally great characters where you're not sure who and what you're rooting for. So like, um, the previous book, um, Dawson talks a lot about, yeah, feminism within this, like, um, it is basically a real world that just has witches who weren't all burned at the stake when we all thought they were. That's sort of the premise that you're living in set between, like, Manchester, Hesden Bridge, London, and then this book takes us to loads of different places around the world, to Greece, to Turkey, um, just, like, travels to, um, sort of save and rescue certain different witches so I really liked that um like explore adventure part of the story and then it talks um within the world a lot about sort of the manosphere and um incel culture and deep-rooted misogyny that leads men to commit heinous acts of violence in this case against witches but against any marginalized community i guess is what dawson is pointing at and i thought it was like i say seamlessly seamlessly executed and yeah a great series if you haven't already listened to it then i finished i started and finished uh elena ferrante is the lost daughter i picked this up from siska's shelf because i wanted a short book to read while i was there but i didn't actually end up reading it that much in the end on sunday I like so I started it and was enjoying it and then when I got back to Amsterdam which I always find that sometimes jarring when you've only read a tiny bit of a book and then you move the environment and the situation that you're reading it in I was like oh I really don't want to read this and I thought about DNFing it but I was like it's so short come on get on board and in the end I did really enjoy it I don't I did I did really enjoy it actually and it was shorter I've only ever also read A Lying Life of Adults and if you've heard League of the Schmilk spiel on here before in loads of places my mum is such a Ferrante person so I haven't read the Neapolitan series because she begged me to read it for like four years and I just my teenage rebellion said no thank you and they never um have picked it up since so this book did make me think I would like that but I also think I like this so much because it was short Ferrante. A Lying Life of Adults which was her is her newest is it her newest no, so she's released on fiction but it's her like latest novel i read with a group of friends sort of the year it came out and i thought it was so it just needed a good edit like it was way too long and too um too confused i guess and this one felt really tight the narrative was um really streamlined you were talking about one person in one particular circumstance over the course of just a few days like it was it was all just really tightly wound together and that's I think when I really enjoy Ferrante's work so um I really liked the way that uh the characterization as it's described on the cover as a frank novel of maternal ambivalence the way that this novel talks about mothering and being mothered and particularly sort of that generational shift, I think, I hope we're experiencing at the moment where people don't feel the need just to have kids because it's the done thing. Like people are having kids because they feel strongly about raising a child, not just maternal ambivalence. Like it's probably what we should do. So I think this book was really interesting to talk about that sort of 
yeah that period and that uh conversation about motherhood and i think it also illustrates the uh the suffocating nature of motherhood in neoliberal capitalist society where um so many of the household duties and so much of mothering is solitary and left to just the mother and in this book the the mother has a has her children are grown up now but while her children were young her, she goes through a divorce and so sort of like a, a messy separation and then she takes herself away from her kids for a few years and talks about to these other people that she meets sort of how she didn't really know why she needed to do it but she knew she had to because she felt suffocated and her creativity was lost and sort of how that's obviously so looked down upon as a mother but in any other context um and if it was a man doing that in a heteronormative relationship then that would have been like far more acceptable so i thought yeah it was very interesting on all of those things um hideous cover but something i like about the ferrante ugly cover so really enjoyed this one and now i'm really looking forward to watching as the sticker says the olivia coleman netflix movie about it because i think that'll also be an enjoyable watch so perhaps you'll get my thoughts on that when i'm done this week week as well actually i maybe not because i'm gonna make this a shorter weekend in my life sort of vlog just because yeah i got back from london it's been a week and now it's friday night and i am looking forward to the weekend after a busy and hard week so we're gonna do some cooking tom and i got the ingredients to make some really yummy tofu bao buns we're going to maybe also make ice chai because um siska made really nice ice chai last weekend so I went to the Indian supermarket and got the supplies for that and not sure what else reading maybe some swimming who knows but yeah it's going to be a bit of a short one but I'll get back to you tomorrow with whatever I pick up next We're braving a storm for late night pizza and returns of shopping items I don't need. <laughs> the dress is secondhand H&M. I just got it. I love this big set and I love the big lace on the bottom. Shadows, cause this is vintage. Bag is from a store in Brighton. And I just Amber's sunny socks. Excuse the lighting. It is so dark in the apartment right now. Good morning everyone, it is Saturday and I had a bit of a rough end of the day yesterday uh, but Tom rectified it by going to get us burritos from the local Tex-Mex place and I also made ice chai, which I just spilled on the floor, so I guess it's not the bad vibes are continuing a bit. But I woke up, had a really bad night's sleep, but I woke up feeling excited for the weekend because we have zero plans. And that feels good. Like to just bop around town, have a mooch, have a rest. I want to like clean the bathroom, <laughs> paint my toenails, you know, just like summer admin bits which i'm really looking forward to maybe we'll go to the garden center push the boat out a little put on a nice outfit for aforementioned trip we're just gonna go get some pastries this morning and read our books maybe in the park but my eyes are already streaming because hay fever and i don't know how long i'm gonna last with the neckerchief and my hair down because it is sweltering in the city today i just went to open the balcony and i was like this is a two watering plant situation kind of day because it's so warm but like i said make good ice chai siska sent me a recipe and i went on the hunt she's a chai connoisseur some may say a masala chai connoisseur so i went to our local indian supermarket did i already say that and bought all the ingredients and the only type of assam tea they had was like a kilogram bag so now i have that in my kitchen but it was a very therapeutic cooking process and I think I might have steeped the tea for a bit too long because it's a tiny bit too bitter for my taste, but it was delicious and just tastes like proper instead of when you get, some places around here do good 
massage ice but others just use like a chai syrup and I'm not paying four euros for that because I could just do that at home so that was a nice process and then I drank most of it and spilled a bit on the floor so that's not bad but I re remembered that yesterday I forgot to show you the books that I came home from London with because is it a trip back to London without purchasing of the books I actually was really good so the first one this is actually a book I bought second hand I've already read I bought it last year it's been sitting on Siska's shelf waiting for her to read it before I could like bring it back home this is one of my all-time favorite family sagas I just feel like it's so criminally underrated and I got this on Depop because the paperback edition of this is also hideous and I feel like stopped so many people picking it up but it's one of my favorite books of all time I might even reread it this summer it's one I need to send to my mum um A Place for Us by Fatima Fahin Mirza and I heard about this book when I on Jen you know you guys know Jen Jen Campbell's channel years and years and years ago she interviewed they did an interview together and that was like before I even made content or anything and I read it got it from my local library and I read this edition of it as well so I really wanted to find a copy of it second hand and it follows it's like a family saga following an Indian Muslim family in the states talks a lot about migration um cultural norms expectations and then there's like a through line about sort of substance abuse and um dealing with that as a as a family and how complicated it can be estrangement and things like that so it's just such a good book and it's like one of that this and america is not for us why about no america's not the heart i like my gold standard of family intergenerational family saga that i hold all other family sagas i read too because i know how good they can be so happy to have that one on my shelves although my shelves are exploding so i really need to be lobbying tom for a new bookshelf when we come back from summer holidays and then in hatchards in king's cross station which is a beautiful book so i think they are a subsidy of either Dawn or Waterstones, I'm not sure, but the one in, in St Pancras is really beautiful. And I went in there innocently because I got off the Eurostar and thought, fuck, I think I've forgotten Siska's birthday card. I don't want to not give her a birthday card. And I'm quite like her. I like to write long notes, the writer part of me to my friends in their birthday cards and make them cry. So, which I did successfully do this year. I received a text just yesterday saying it made her cry. So that's good. Um, and I, so I didn't want to be without a card. So I popped in because I saw some nice cards in the window and I think I even put them in a clip. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another. Here I am with a book. I picked up a Fitz book just because like they are so much harder to come by in Amsterdam and they are so much more expensive sort of compared to export paperbacks and just like they're not as commonly found, I guess, because they're an indie press. So I picked up a copy of would you say paradise this is called it's the second Fernanda Melcher I read her first book hurricane season at the end of last year and really enjoyed it like it was such an all-consuming over the top car crash I couldn't look away from kind of reading experience and when I saw how small this one was I thought like hey I should pick that up as well um and it was 10.99 so yes that was an accident and then not so much an accident but when my friend ellie picked me up on sunday she was like i've got an idea feel free to say no do you want to go to crystal pass and go to the bookshop and i was like how can i say no i'm the bookish friend i'm i'm the purveyor of books in in the friendship i could not deny you a trip to the bookshop with little of me so she had in her head already that she wanted to buy the new Caleb Azuma Nelson, which makes me so proud so proud that my my irl friends are, are listening to my gospel and um so we went into, I think it's called Crow on the Hill. It's the only um, indie bookshop in Crystal Palace, so you would know it. It's like down the hill, next to some coffee shops. And we popped in there. It was nice, actually. It had a really nice selection. It had some 404 ink clings, not one I was looking for. Really liked the nonfiction and then had also a lovely children's book section. And my friend's a teacher, so we went through looking at all of the picture books and that always makes me happy to see what new and cool picture books are out in the world and then I picked up a copy of this which I've been wanting to read for ages and again harder to come by in the Netherlands because it is um Charco Press this is Jennifer Cross Homesick and this is from Charco Press's new untranslated line so they are translators of mostly South American and um 
not only, but I guess they focus a lot on Latin American translation, but um, Jennifer Croft translated Drive Your Plow and a few other books that she's like well known. It says, yes, she won the 2022 Guggenheim Fellowship for her own novel and she's won various different, the, the book International Translation from Polish and she's translated, she translated the books of Jacob, Jesus, I hope that took her ages. Yeah, she translates, I think, in a lot of different languages, but this is her um, sort of debut with Charcoal Press's new line and this had been, sounded like it appealed to me since I first put it in a radar video. So I'll just read you the back. It says, this is a coming of age story of a precocious Amy who shares everything with her little sister, Zo little sister Zoe, not only a private language, but also an alluring young teacher. <sighs> the sister's ideal is shattered by, sorry, that sigh, an unexpected death and Zoe's mysterious illness as Amy realizes that she has to become an adult and achieve her dreams, therefore must reckon with the promises she's made to her sibling. A moving novel of growing older, to told with frankness and a wide-eyed sense of wonder, capturing a singular world of a shared height, childhood and a heartbreak of leaving it all behind and when I picked it up and saw it was in these little vignettes something I love to read and something that really suits me especially in the summer months I think it um I think it um will be one that I will really enjoy and obviously the theme of illness is something that always appeals to me so yeah I'm really looking forward to reading this one probably on my like summer reading list so that's what I picked up and I did also buy one more book at um, Crown the Hill in Crystal Palace, which was Fight Night by Miriam Toes. And you might say, Hannah, you've already read it. I've seen your copy of it. And that's true. I bought it for Siska. Like, she's only read Women Talking. And I just like, I'm always on the gospel of Miriam, aren't I? Always getting more people to read it. And um, she was saying that we both are having a similar problem with our bookshelf. We're, we're buying stuff and reading it really quickly, which is really good. But then this older stuff on our shelves is sitting for longer. And she was like, I really don't have that many books I want to read. I was like, how can I let my best friend not have any books she wants to read? Uh, so I picked that one up also because it's like funny and lighthearted. And I just think it's a book she would love, but not necessarily one she would buy for herself. So when I saw it with that on paperback, I thought, let me support my girl Miriam and my best friend's reading taste. So I don't have that to show you, but I did purchase that as a little present for her. And then, should I tell you about what I'm reading now? Mrs. S by Kay Patrick, which is a book that's doing the rounds a lot at the moment. This is a proof copy. The final copy is a much more interesting cover. And I'm about 100 pages in. The writing style is not for me, but I am intrigued. It's not for me, but I can admire it, if that makes sense. It's not, it's not for me in a way that I'm finding it irritating or... I would say sometimes frustrating, it's mainly the dialogue and I'm not like, I'm a Sally Rudy stan. I don't care about no question, no speech marks, like that stuff doesn't bother me. I'm not like a militant about grammar in that sense. Like I like playful and inventive writing, but something about this, I just, I'm finding quite confusing, I guess, in the interactions. If you haven't heard people talk about this, whether it's a story of an Australian matron, like um, exchange sort of, if you, sort of like old-fashioned boarding school they they're not necessarily the house mistress but they sort of just are the Australian person kicking around school which is what she talks about in this book um she helps out where she's needed and she's got she's a, a young lesbian woman and she has got the hots for the headmaster's wife Mrs S who is this quite foreboding and self-assured she takes on like a counseling pastoral role in the school and has a very intimate relationship with the girls who are like a choral voice considered we don't really get a singular perspective of any of the girls they are just called the girls at the board like at the all girls boarding school and we follow them on this sort of sordid sexually charged set of um interactions as i guess they're going to start an affair at some point so I'm intrigued sort of to get to that point and there is definitely sexual tension building, it's very atmospheric and there's conversations very lightly touched so far about gender and our narrator's experience like wearing a binder and being very unsure of their physical body and not really sure how that relates to their sexuality and like it's done in a very yeah light touch leaving a lot of questions to the reader way that I'm really really enjoying. That's Tom back from the gym, go to the gym on a Saturday morning it's my bestie anyway so yeah I am enjoying it so far but the reading the writing style I don't think is for me but I can look past it in this instance instance 
Um, and then I'm listening to My Life as a Villainess, Essays by Laura Lippmann. Um, Laura Lippmann is a big crime writer and was previously like a big journalist in the States. And I don't, I'm not familiar with any of her fiction work, but this, I just wanted to start an essay collection essentially and this one came up on script. And I'm really enjoying it so far, actually, like, not to my surprise, but like, the essays are really making me nod my head. So the first one is about, she's, it's like from an older perspective, I guess is why I'm enjoying it. I've read so many essay collections of people like my age and sort of younger. And I think I underappreciate the benefit of older wisdom, I guess. And this is, I think she must be maybe in her fifties now. Um, so the first essay was about body image and her relationship to dieting from the perspective of an older woman of being like, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of society not changing. I'm sick of, of being always roped in every summer to feeling like that. And it's a feeling I relate to so hard. I wrote like briefly on Instagram, I'm having a hard time growing out a lot of my summer clothes and having to rebuy stuff in a bigger size, even though like intellectually, you know that clothes are meant to fit you. You're not meant to fit the clothes, but still every year it's like just a hard thing to go through. And she talks about finally, like in her middle life, giving up dieting for good and sort of being like fuck it food just tastes too good to care what i look like in any kind of vanity project or diet culture way so i really found that essay quite refreshing and then the second essay i've listened to is about having her daughter in her 40s and that relationship to being an older mother so a lot of it i guess is also about aging and the opinions of other people people assuming that because she had her daughter late, that meant that she had her daughter by herself and the assumption of single motherhood, whereas she just sort of had her daughter late because of facility issues and also meeting her partner a bit later in life and how people, all the different stereotypes people place on people who have kids later in life and like being an older mother is unfair and selfish and those kinds of questions. So I really enjoy her tone of voice. It's not particularly groundbreaking, I guess, as a, as a, as a piece of work in terms of like there's plenty of other people writing about this stuff but i guess i'm finding her perspective really um not comforting isn't the right word but just like maybe it is like maternal maybe just like i guess it's, it's that older relationship to like older it's like almost as if my mum was writing these although i think she is a bit younger than my mum so yeah that is what i'm in, enjoying at the moment let's go get some pastries and i'll let you know how the rest of saturday goes shop and the girls in there know us now and the lads and ladettes in the coffee shop also know us and I love that feeling you know it's nice and he saw me because Tom has like bumped the wheelchair in because it's um for all those annoying old child steps and as soon as she saw me she was like do you want one from the fridge she knows my favorite fizzy pop so she also was like you know we sell them by the case if you want to get a discount and I was like if I do that I will just drink this every day Rhubarb and lavender, soda. And then they sounded so good to me from Berlin, pear and rosemary, um, fizzy pop. Germany makes some excellent fizzy pop, so I'm excited for that. Really like pear sometimes. And Tom got a super soda ginger beer. Uses 28 grams of unwanted ginger, low sugar, less waste, great taste. Made in Soda Lab, the Netherlands. The nicest packaging on this one. Then he got two burrs. This one, because it made us laugh so much, it's called Pinky in the Grain. This is quite a big brewery here, and I, I'm not a fan of the artwork at all. They like do big posters near us, but it's a hibiscus IPA, 7%, so that's a lot. But we're going to a friend's party next weekend, and I was like, maybe you can use this there. And it's called Pinky in the Grain, that made us laugh so much. Look at it. And then this is another one he was interested in because Poisat and Cater is our local brewery and it's a collab with Mel Keller, which Michaela, Michaela, um, is a really cool brewery we went to when we were in Helsinki last summer and also in London. And they're the brewery where we have 
these lovely drinking glasses from. So this is a double black IPA when Harry met Poissa and Sally met Kata. An iconic duo for a steamy Dutch Danish double date. Um, and so if you want to try that as well. And that's also I think six or seven percent. So these are party beers. And then we forgot one to two and some mushrooms for our bao bun feast for our dinner. That was a whole didn't do any reading in the park, just forgot how distracting it is to like be in the park. It was like lots of stuff going on for Ketty Cotty, like people organising and then there was so many cute kids and we were like just people watching the ducks. So I didn't actually do any reading, but I'm feeling really fatigued actually since it's like a bit too hot to be out now. It's like one o'clock, so Gonna have a rest, have some lunch, and then maybe sit on the balcony. We're on bao bun making. I prepped the toppings. We just got with our veggie chopper, it had like a julienne feature, so I made some very thin cucumber, spring onion, coriander, some pickled ginger, miso mushrooms, crispy tofu's in the oven. And a baby bower here, ready to be steamed. We did my text my friend saying we we're making this for dinner as like a nice sort of date night at home. And she was like, Wow, you're making the bow buns yourself? And I was like, Come on, I'm not that not that much of a cooking person. Pop chairs. I promise I won't eat all the ice cream. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I was really gonna put my hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's some good camera foregrounding. The rocket. Yeah. I'll leave for now. <laughs> How spicy do you want yours? Um, not too spicy because it's quite hot. The weather is hot. If you had an ice cream. I was actually out of work. It's Monday and I wanted to sign off this vlog. The weekend was really lovely, although I fear that it only looks like I had a really wonderful time when actually um, I spent a lot of my energy cooking, which was so much fun, but I was asleep for like four to five hours in the afternoons feeling really unwell and I'm just having a really hard time balancing my fatigue at the moment. So don't let the lovely montages um, dissuade you from thinking and Tom's in the background going like this anything other than that but and it's monday today and i spent the day in so much pain and got really upset about it but now i put on some nice clothes because i'm going to meet my friend rebecca and her husband sam they are like passing through amsterdam on the way to a book event in berlin i believe um so we're going for some drinks and some ceremonies food for dinner rebecca is a big foodie so I'm excited, although our local ceremony spot that we adored had a fire earlier in this year and they haven't reopened since, so um, we're going to have to try out a new place, which always makes me nervous when I have guests, but we can all do it together and enjoy some tempeh and some roti, which I'm so looking forward to. The temperature's do dropped a bit today, so it's nice, although I think I made a mistake putting on makeup because it's definitely not that, <laughs> dropped that much where I'm not going to sweat this off, so... That's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing this evening on a Monday night. Um, and like I said, been unwell all day, but we try again tomorrow. Book wise, I actually spent a lot of the day listening to My Life's a Villainess by Laura Lippman and I've really been enjoying it. Um, I worked out that she was born. She's pretty much, I think the same age as my mom. And it's following on like I spoke about um, in the earlier section about um, 
becoming a mother in later life and then she's talked about the menopause and experiences of that with her and her friends and um now in like part three she's talking about journalism her life as a rookie reporter the different places that she went sorry brief interruption there for a change of plans but um yeah, I've really, I've really enjoyed what I listened to so far and she's talking now about her relationship to Twitter, which I think is interesting um, as a sort of like person at the higher end of the demographic perhaps that use um, social media. And it was also a really great essay about loss of friendship and sort of uh, historic friendships that dwindle out and how you don't really know how to say goodbye to those people and sort of good ghosting in friendships um, and that kind of stuff, which I thought was really insightful. So yeah, it's definitely not like any mind breaking, radical, personal political views or anything, but it's just um, really comforting in a way to listen to. And like I say, I don't read a lot of non-fiction, personal, like perspective essays from um, a person of Littman's age. So I think that's, um, yeah, a novel experience that I'm enjoying. And then I've got about 100 pages left of Mrs. S. Still, the writing style is not sticking for me, but I do give Patrick credit for its atmospheric tension building, the scene setting, they're at a dinner right now. So the matron and the house mistress, who are two young lesbian women, are at dinner with Mrs. S and her husband's the headmaster and the headmistress. And, um, the dinner party setup is reminding me of the dinner party in Brandon Taylor's real life and that real like icky skin crawling awkwardness of having dinner with people and sort of conversations going awry and people sneaking off to kitchens um also reminded me of that of like some of the dinner scenes in conversations with friends so yeah I really do think the scene development and those like intimate details really help you imagine what what's happening but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing this one and starting something where the writing really sets me alight. So that's the reading update and the end of this video. I hope you liked a weekend in my life. And I had a few comments and questions in recent videos about food, um, like recipes and stuff. So I'm going to link my Pinterest because that's where I get a lot of recipes from. Granted, a lot of them I take liberties with and more just like take the idea. Like last night, that, that um, harissa hummus and lentil bowl was so delicious. Um, but I just saw a picture of something and thought I could kind of recreate it. But I will link my Pinterest because the food board on there, because I think that is where a lot of food comes from. So that is what the only other thing I had to say. And I'll see you all in the next one. If you'd like to subscribe, that would be great. And I'll see you soon. Bye.